Well, um, welcome everybody. Welcome fellow students and panelists. Uh, this is our uh, third uh, in the Science Circle series of panel discussions um, in voice. So uh, hopefully everyone here is able to uh, uh, hear me and the panelists in voice. A um, uh, little bit of change of pace this weekend. Um, instead of, you know, the, the heavy topics that we did uh, the last two uh, sessions, uh, science versus religion and the Fermi paradox, which were heavy, uh, heavy duty. Um, we're going to lighten things up a little bit this time. And our topic is uh, favorite, favorite science fiction movies. Um, uh, the, um, this is a topic that could easily sort of uh, digress into just a bull session. So I wanted to try to establish uh, a couple of parameters to maybe try to uh, impose some structure on it. So one of the things I want the panelists to keep in mind is for the movies they've chosen, uh, I would like to ask them to um, tell us a little bit about what they like about the science in the movies. I'm still getting a little feedback from Tagline's microphone. I hope that's not uh, bothering everyone. Um, and then uh, in addition to what they like about the science in the movies, uh, I thought we should discuss sort of what is it about the movies that inspire us to think about science or to think about uh, nature. So, um, Tag Line, why don't you just try uh, muting your microphone um, until, uh, until you're speaking. <laughs> There, that's better. Um, that was distracting to me because I'm, I'm hearing it in my uh, my headset, so it sounds loud. Um, so to begin with, um, I would like to introduce our panelists. Um, uh, and then I want to go sort of down the row and ask each of them to say a few words uh, about themselves. Uh, tell us a little bit about know who you are, um, what your interest in science is, um, I guess any sort of um, education or credentials or whatever you might have that you think be helpful for the audience to know, something like that. Comments about that. So um, our panelists going from my left is Syzygy Asymptote. Um, Tagline and um, Mike Shaw, um, who I think are uh, all of them are familiar to uh, the Science Circle students. So, uh, Sidji, let me start with you. Um, why don't you uh, just say a few words about yourself? Yes, thank you, Barry. Uh, I appreciate the work you do here. Um, and I do enjoy being on the panel, but if someone else would like to be on the panel in the future, I urge people to consider being on the panel. I agree. Um, yes. <clears throat> okay, in, in real life, I, I, my name is William F. Wall. I'm an astronomy researcher and a professor at the National Institute of Astrophysics, Optics, and Electronics in Tontla, Pueblo. So recently, we've been the lead institution of a large millimeter wave telescope. It's a a national lab right now. Um, <clears throat> so I uh, I study uh, interstellar molecular clouds on large scales, scales of many parsecs and scales. Um, I teach graduate courses and I also give public talks in, in Mexico and I've, I've given them in Canada on the LMT. Um, after one of my talks, uh, one woman uh, from the audience approached me and s said, uh, proclaimed triumphantly that she understood. And uh, that, what that means is that she's been having uh, trouble understanding uh, scientific talks uh, for at least some of the time, and it raises an interesting question. I mean, how well do scientists communicate their messages to 
inside their fields, public, be not quite good enough. Consider that with, uh, in conjunction with uh, inadequate science education in schools, that leads to widespread scientific illiteracy. And this is a, a, a problem that I want to address, and that's one of the reasons I'm participating in the science circle. But this leads me to science fiction, because science fiction, good science fiction can educate us, and we love stories, and it, it helps weave science into our culture. And, but science fiction can also diagnose the literacy, uh, scientific illiteracy of, of a society, because what passes for science fiction in popular culture is shows a severe ignorance of science. It's very often it inspires us. That's that's right, Chantal. Um, but it, it's it's an ind indication of a severe ignorance of science if you have movies and television programs which are off as science. And I like fantasy too, but not science. Distinguish between good science fiction sparks our imaginations, uh, spark real innovation sometimes. The science fiction already about the future, help us to understand how to survive in a sometimes violent universe, how to deal with each other and other beings, how to live inside our own heads, and can also make us uh, question the very nature of reality. Uh, Matrix is one example of it. And it can do so in the way that no other genre can. Because fantasy, for example, is not real, but science fiction could become real, potentially real. And uh, I, I, I'll, the three movies that I chose to talk about um, that are, they're not perfect, but they, they are science fiction. One is Extinction with My, Michael Pena. Um, that's on Netflix. Um, and I, Robot, which is an amalgamation of, uh, of Isaac Asimov stories with Will Smith and Bridget Moynihan. And Gattaca. Is about uh, about how genetics um, can affect or, or not affect human culture with uh, Ethan Hawke. Outstanding. Yeah, those are all excellent choices. I'm actually not familiar with Extinction. I'm going to have to uh, check that out on Netflix. Um, I appreciate those comments, Suzy. That's uh, that's fantastic. Um, tagline. Why don't you share a little bit about yourself? Okay, I'm. A compulsively private person, so I go by tagline here. But I will say that I have a background in mathematics, and not currently, but uh, in the past, my academic involvement, uh, the biggest was um, on being on the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. I'm, I'm a physician, and uh, nowadays I do pretty much what I want. <laughs> and, all right. Yes, and that's all I have to say about that. As tell us a little bit about um, the movies you selected. Well, the uh, uh, first a comment on uh, the idea of science fiction. Uh, I had. Um, an epic fail today. I'd made up 64 slides, uh, including slides to illustrate uh, or show images from the um, uh, choices of the uh, the gentleman here, but uh, I couldn't get it to work. So uh, this will all be verbal, uh, but uh, people that like sci-fi, uh, have imagination, so we should be able to overcome that. Science fiction is speculative fiction. I think of it as coming from literature and coming from human uh, kind of innate uh, linguistic ability to tell stories and further to imagine what you're not able to do or see, but to be able to live it in your mind. Um, can also be described as a type of writing about imagined developments in science, advanced science and tech, space flight, time travel, extraterrestrial life, and that sort of thing, but especially their effect on life and the future. Now, I had uh, two quotes I wanted to share with you. One was by Robert Schulz, 
Uh, science fiction can be described as that branch of literature which deals with the reaction of human beings to changes in science and technology. I think that is really insightful. The changes in sci science and technology and how we keep up with it uh, uh, is at the heart of science fiction, I think. And, Science fiction began, modern science fiction began with the, uh, in most people's view, uh, with the publication of uh, uh, Frankenstein by Sh uh, Mary Shelley in the early uh, 19th century. And then 1828, she published The Last Man, which was also sci-fi, and it was about uh, the outcome of, of or consequences of a massive plague and that's been used quite a lot. Uh, Stephen King did uh, um, a book that was made into a television movie called The, S the Stand about a um, devastating plague, uh, for example. So that's, that kind of apocalyptic uh, fiction has uh, been with us and been on our mind for quite a while. But Isaac Asimov in 75, at the same year that um, Robert Schulz made his statement about uh, the nature of science fiction, he said, science fiction is anything published as science fiction. Asimov was a biochemist, uh, but a prolific writer. Also, he was Russian and uh, I, I like Brooklyn a lot. That's where he passed away, 92. Um, the ones I chose were um, in chronological order, 1951, the day the earth stood still, 1978, invasion of the body snatchers, uh, 1986, the fly with Jeff Goldblum, and 2004, The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And uh, I've always loved literature or cultural experiences that helped me understand what it is to be human. And the exploration of consequences of uh, the presumptions that they impose upon us uh, in sci-fi uh, uh, really explore that. Um, it's really striking to me how easily people can go with the flow and I, I suggested uh, presumption, like the very idea that you could have a teleporter or uh, be disassembled um, into elementary particles or atoms and then reassembled. And uh, okay, I can go with that. And then you follow through the story. Um, on the other hand, uh, it uh, at its extreme uh, reflects extreme gullibility of humankind. Uh, as we see people willing to believe most anything these days um, as long as it tends to agree with their prejudices. So those are my choices. I can tell more about them in a bit, but I'll let... Uh, um, uh, uh, okay, that's uh, fine. Uh, very good. Uh, a very interesting selection of movies in particular. Um, classics all. Um, and uh, let's move right along. And Mike, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your the movies you picked. All right. Um, let's see. I'll move my microphone just a little bit so we don't get me reading. There we go. Um, okay. Well, um, I was born in the eastern townships of southern Quebec, Canada. Um, um, you should go and visit uh, for the fall foliage, stay for the wineries, apple cider, and maple syrup. Um, I went to, um, I got my bachelor degree in chemistry at a school called Mount Allison University. It's at the tip of the Bay of Fundy in New Brunswick, Canada. Uh, it's famous for its uh, nine meter vertical tides. 
Um, my, uh, I have a PhD in organometallic chemistry from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver uh, from 1993. And uh, I moved to uh, University of Vermont uh, where I was a postdoctoral fellow and then a lecturer, um, again, or organometallic uh, electrochemistry. Um, scary jargon words, uh, sorry. Um, but, very simple concept, basically, uh, looking at the chemistry of species which contain a metal attached to a carbon atom. Um, um, in 1998, I started at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, as an assistant professor. I've been there ever since. Um, worked the way up the chain. I've been chair. Um, glad that's over. Um, and uh, right now, uh, they call me distinguished research professor, but. Uh, probably not after they talked to me twice. Um, so, you know, I've, I've had a good career. Um, I'm in the middle of it. Um, there's uh, funding. There have been wonderful, wonderful students. Um, I think I've had something about, about 25 master's students and maybe 40 um, undergraduate students work with me for the, in the past 20 years. Uh, and one of the wonderful things is to see how um, popular culture influences their expectations of their um, um, for their lives and careers. Um, and so, um, the movies I've chosen uh, kind of reflect that. Um, there's uh, two movies uh, that I chose, and um, my reasoning was that since we were looking at uh, science fiction, uh, movies that could happen with what we know now, um, um, that, that was a, a good criteria for me. So the first is Europa Report. Um, and Europa reports on Netflix, uh, it's a story told through a series of flashbacks, log entries, and interviews about the first crew of people sent to study Europa. Um, they um, experience a lot of setbacks along the way that test them and leave them with no communication to Earth. Um, they decide to finish their mission, and they uh, find a way to send back the amazing results they find. Well, that's the good news, and the bad news, no survivors. Um, the, the, the second movie was Ex Machina. Um, it's on Amazon Prime, maybe other places. And this one's about uh, Caleb, a programmer who's employed by a mysterious billionaire to assess Ava, who is a humanoid robot, um, and basically assessing her sentience like a Turing test. During the events of the film, Caleb's humanity is tested. Um, I'm still trying to figure out if the end of the film represents uh, the beginning of the singularity. It's a very Westworld type of uh, type of movie. Um, so, um, you know, these these two I actually think are um, um, very solid science fiction, where um, there's I don't think that there's any um, leap of faith that um, has to happen. I don't think there's any um, um, technology that's out of our reach to make um, these things uh, possible. Um, you know, as uh, Tagline said, teleporters, uh, that, you know, we could disassemble something molecule by molecule, but then we might reassemble it into a smoking heap, um, which would be unfortunate if that had been a person. Um, and faster than light travel, um, has has its own uh, problems as well. So uh, that's where I'll be, um, end, and um, I think uh, we can um, start with a good discussion between us. Huh? Uh, yeah, fantastic. Uh, these are all great movies. Um, I, I suppose I should also uh, tell a little bit about myself. Um, in real life, I'm uh, Matthew Burr. I um, uh, have some science background. Uh, my father was a chemist um, with uh, Rockwell International. He also, uh, during in the 60s, during the Apollo and Gemini programs in California. Brother is also a biologist. He and um, I uh, 
worked in labs a lot uh, in high school and college. Um, ended up uh, working in a lab at MIT with my uh, brother, uh, my oldest brother, uh, in the lab of James Buchanan, who I'm sure is now retired. But um, when I was 19, I got to present the uh, work of that laboratory at a scientific meeting in San Diego. I was at college at UC San Diego at the time. So that was kind of a highlight of my science career. And uh, I also did graduate work at Baylor College of Medicine, which is how I ended up in Texas. And, um, but, uh, so I had uh, ambitions to be a working scientist all through my youth. Uh, but when I was actually in graduate school, I had something of a midlife crisis at 25, where I kind of freaked out at the prospects of trying to make a living in academia. So guess what? I bailed out and went to law school. That's refuge of the scoundrel. Uh, I've been a, because of my technical background, I became a patent attorney. I've been a patent and trademark attorney. But I've always maintained my, I do at least. Keep up with it as a lay person my whole life. Um, and let me see. So the movies I picked, um, let me see if I can pull up my list. Um, and uh, I have to say, uh, I, I've thought about more movies since I, I just came up with a couple. You know, I thought we should at least mention a 2001 A Space Odyssey. I feel like that's a classic sci-fi movie. I'm a little bit surprised uh, it hadn't been already picked, but I think that should be on our list. Another one a little more obscure is called Surrogates. Uh, it's from 2009 with Bruce Willis. I'm actually not even sure it's available. I think you might be able to like, see it on YouTube for two or three dollars. Um, uh, but I enjoy that movie a lot. And uh, I also um, added an honorable mention uh, that I think maybe is not on our official list, but I wanted, I thought Steven Spielberg should be represented in our list because he's done some seminal sci fi movies. But the one I picked was Ready Player One, his most recent one. Um, I actually particularly like because I liked the fiction of life in a virtual world and what it's like to have relationships in a virtual world with people you only know through their avatars. Um, I thought the movie did that, so I wanted to give that an honor. Um, uh, so, let's see. Um, why don't we, uh, let me take a look, is there, let me kind of poll the audience, perhaps. Um, is there uh, anything, um, uh, any particular movie that we mentioned so far that uh, our students would uh, like us to delve into, perhaps, right away? Oh, someone mentioned Narnia in local chat. I did want to mention that um, I specifically um, uh, wanted to exclude fantasy like Lord of the Rings and Narnia and uh, Harry Potter and things like that. Um, you know, unless you could make a strong case about that they have something to say about science. Um, but um, but uh, but I, I did. I, I thought we should we should uh, limit our discussion to um, if. Uh, no one minds. I kind of would like to open up maybe with a discussion of Gattaca. Um, I think that that's um, a movie maybe people have not seen in a while. And I recently watched rewatched it uh, about a year or so ago. And uh, I actually was much more impressed with it in rewatching it than I was when I saw it in the theaters. Um, uh, it really has a, a pretty gripping story about the um, social impacts of genetic engineering. Um, and uh, so um, if, if uh, no one objects, uh, let me open up the discussion to Gattaca. Sure, I suppose I should jump in here since I introduced that one. Um, 
Yeah, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you what I do like about it and what I don't like about it, but l let me describe the movie a little bit first, is that it is a, a society that's probably not too far in the future. And uh, it's not really... Um, it's not really a meritocracy anymore. It's more that you get uh, what you get. You get good, uh, get uh, good positions in uh, corporations or, or, or universities or wherever based on your genes. And yes, you do have to uh, skills in, in those areas, but it's mostly because of your genes. Um, do you have a genetic um, uh, predisposition for certain types of jobs? Of employment, uh, it, um, it's 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 um, genetic engineering. What I liked about it is the science seemed well. It seemed a little simplistic to me, the way they present. Already not in. Um. It it uh, what I liked about it was that people just had to go somewhere and have their genes uh, read and then they could you know figure out what their medical problems are going to be the predisposition that is is a that is essentially a good thing as it can help you in the future but the problem is that you are also classified put into a pigeonhole and that's the part that uh, I don't like and I'm wondering if that's what's going to happen in the future will we roll like that perhaps not the movie itself was making a very strong statement about nature versus, versus nurture. They were saying that this main character played not, uh, he was considered one of God, he was not a child, so he was genetically defective and should not be trying to become an astronaut. Which, um, but he was able to borrow someone else's genetic material, um, as his roommate basically, Abled man who had extremely good genes but could not do anything because he had a wheelchair over. Um, so it was kind of ironic that the one with great genes couldn't aspire to the position that he was supposedly ideal for, but this genetically defective God's children, God's child, could could do this because he did it by sheer will and hiding his genetic material. He was always cleaning his keyboard for. Example. There was also a, a movie, a, a murder in the movie, which um, they were looking for who committed the murder, and they figured they'd find his genes, and they thought they were trying to identify who was response, who was the one who had those genes. Um, so they figured he was the one who, who committed the murder because he was genetically inferior. They they couldn't identify who it was at first, um, and they never really did by the end of the movie. But it turned out to be one of the instructors who was genetically superior, and he's the one who committed the. Throughout this movie, they're making a very bold statement that uh, your your personality and who you are is not totally dictated by your genes. I did like the message. It, was, it came across a little too heavily, but I did like the message. Um, isn't there uh, one of the most vivid scenes? There's a couple of vivid scenes in that. You know, one where the wheelchair guy is tied by crawling up the stairs of his to yeah, I, I like that. Oh, sorry, are you going to say more? Well, that's very gripping. But I guess the one I was actually really thinking of, isn't there a scene where he has to go through a checkpoint, I think, like to get into work? Um, but uh, And, of course, they, they, they sample the DNA as at the checkpoint to, you know, I guess make sure you're authorized. And he has some kind of a like fake blood or like a, a um, I can't remember exactly specifically, but um, but it's very tense about whether uh, he has some kind of a little packet of fake blood or something that he has to submit to the checkpoint. That, remember that at all? Yes, um, I do remember that. It was he was wearing something like fake skin, and, and within the fake yeah. skin was was a pool of, of blood, and that was from his roommate who had the the, the greater genes. And while, right. going, and while he was going through the checkpoint, he had to remove his contact lenses. Um, otherwise, they would know. Uh, they would, when they check him, they would know he had the contact lenses and was trying to be someone else. And also, there was a scene where he was climbing up the the, the 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 staircase. The interesting thing about that staircase is it was a spiral staircase. It looked like a double helix, 
It looked like, it, I mean, it was a metaphor. He was trying to climb up, and he was trying to uh, achieve, in a metaphorical sense, he was trying to aspire to his own genetic potential by crawling up that staircase. Oh, I love that. I never picked up on that the first time, but I, yeah, that's a uh, that's a, a great detail to to pick out. Yeah. May I comment? Yes. I thought please, that was ahead. I thought that was wonderfully artistic. There were several shots with Jude Law sitting in his wheelchair with this spiral double helix uh, staircase or uh, uh, stairwell, I guess, staircase behind him. And uh, uh, it showed um, the, the idea of all this uh, genetic parameters as qualifying for uh, quality of humanness uh, being imposed upon people. The other thing about Jude Law in that he was the Ubermensch who had uh, all the physical skills, the extraordinary intelligence, and excellent genetic makeup. He had thrown it away. He had caused his uh, handicap. He had broken his spine by throwing himself in front of a bus, I think, um, in despondence. And that, along with a point where the um, Ethan Hawke uh, against his brother, uh, they had swimming contests, and uh, he managed to beat his brother, and who was genetically superior. And his brother finally asked him, "How did you do that?" And he said, "I, uh, you know, he didn't save anything for the trip back. They would swim out into the harbor, and then swim back. He swam with everything he had to get to the goal." and dealt with any shortcoming later, even if he might drown. And the extraordinary thing about this statement was that uh, this idea of superior beings uh, with better genes uh, doesn't beat heart and determination and will, as Sergei mentioned. And it's a great movie. Excellent those, those comments. Are, I appreciate that. Yeah, those are excellent points. I mean, uh, uh, the swimming, the swimming um, s scenes, or at least a couple of those scenes where they're racing against each other and seeing who can get further. I think that that was a little bit overdone. I'm not entirely sure that uh, willpower can beat out genes uh, completely, but it, it, it was a good point. And I'd forgotten that uh, the character played by Jude Law had, had broken his own back and. Uh, that that's an, an, another excellent point. That even though you have superior genes, supposedly you, you may not you may not feel comfortable in the society in which which values you. You may, you may feel valued by that society, but may be valued in the wrong way. So you so you become despondent. And that I found a little bit inconsistent was if this is a medically advanced society that can measure your uh, measure your characteristics so so precisely. Then wouldn't they also have the capability of repairing? It struck me as a little bit inconsistent. Very interesting. Um, so, so I'd like to bring up a couple of points. Um, you know, a hallmark of a good science fiction movie is that it stands a uh, test of time and uh, has some uh, predictive character to it. So Gattaca is old enough so that we can actually look at some of the predictions that it uh, made uh, in terms of our own society right now. Um, if you look at uh, genetic testing uh, services, things like 23andMe and the other um, ones uh, that are out there, uh, fast sequencing of um, uh, genetic testing uh, is essentially here. Uh, back when this movie was made, the Human Genome Project was a huge undertaking uh, to sequence one individual's DNA uh, um, basically took years. Now um, such things can happen in a very short amount of time, and perhaps not as short as uh, depicted in the movie. Um, the, the other part is that we now have uh, better gene editing 
um, techniques. Uh, things uh, such as uh, CRISPR um, are now a reality and are beginning to um, be used in ways that align with uh, what we see in this movie. Uh, so, you know, what, one of the things about uh, Gattaca that is uh, wonderful in one sense is that it's highly predictive, but I hope it doesn't predict that particular society. Fascinating. That's just fascinating. You know, uh, it strikes me hearing you mention the gene editing that, um, you know, if gene editing does turn out to be as powerful as its promise holds, um, you know, selecting uh, a population for superior genes uh, could become irrelevant. Um, you don't need to really select for simply engineer people with great. In fact, it may be quite possible that in four or five generations from now, pretty much everyone will be sort of engineered by gene editing to have all of the um, characteristics that are desired. That is an interesting um, scenario that you bring up. It, it, it raises, I mean, will, we, will that result in a utopia or a dystopia, as Vic has mentioned? Uh, uh, it, it, could the gene editing be used to change certain things um, that you probably shouldn't change? <clears throat> like you, yes, you want yes. someone who is super intelligent, but at the same time they lose certain other abilities, like to how to socialize properly, how to uh, avoid certain impulses that are dangerous, uh, as one uh, example. Yes, by achieving one characteristic, you might um, affect other characteristics, you know, sort of in the way that domesticating dogs causes their ears to flop and their tails to curl. Or yeah, and the other, or something like that. Yeah, so that so that certain traits are linked to other traits. They're very unhard. They're very difficult to untangle. Well, I would like to get back to Mike's point. I mean, he, he's right. We we can read uh, genetic sequences now, but the problem is if you get if you use different companies to get uh, to find out what your genetic background is, uh, Eastern European or, or Asian or whatever. It turns out that the different companies give somewhat different results. So there's there's a problem with the calibration of the method. So yes, you can do this now, but it, the, it has to be uh, we're a long way from doing things accurately or consistently. And a related point is that much of this information is now kind of publicly available um, when uh, people get their genetic sequencing done and. Um, upload it to sites that then uh, police agencies can use to track down your relatives who uh, might have done something nefarious. Uh, yes, that is very interesting. Um, forgive me, I'm going to uh, exploit my role as moderator and ask us to move on a little bit because I, I, uh, we have limited time and I do want to discuss some of the other movies. It occurs to me, looking at our list, that perhaps we can discuss iRobot, The Matrix, and even 2001 A Space Odyssey, perhaps together, since uh, each of them um, relate to sort of a machine intelligence or have elements of machine intelligence. Um, so the, that group of three, uh, I think we could sort of discuss together. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to mention about 2001 A Space Odyssey, and one reason it's one of my favorite movies, is for the one single scene when uh, Dave is dismantling Hal, and Hal says, stop, Dave, I'm afraid. And, you know, that was in 1969, and I always felt that that moment where Hal is afraid was just a seminal moment in science fiction of the machine um, who is utterly self-aware and is terrified at losing. Yes, and he sings at the end. <laughs> yes, indeed he does. And um, one thing I really, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm a big fan of the whole Matrix series. I actually like all of the movies, and I also feel that that story resolved itself 
really well um, because, you know, in the first movie, um, uh, Neo um, gets inside, um, who is it? Is it Agent, Agent Smith? <clears throat> and destroys him, but Agent Smith comes back, and now he is a program without any purpose. And the big thing that the agents are, their whole thing is purpose. <clears throat> the concept of purpose permeates the whole uh, mythology of the Matrix. And by losing his purpose, Agent Smith becomes a danger to the machines. So in the third movie, Neo and the machines... Um, form a common cause to defeat Agent Smith. And I thought that was just a very elegant way to resolve that storyline um, because um, the machines could not tolerate a rogue program who had no purpose. And at the same time, uh, Neo, by defeating Agent J, could liberate the humans. So, um, so I thought that was a very interesting a twist to the Matrix. Um, I'm less. I've seen iRobot. I am. I did not love iRobot, but it did have some excellent moments in it. But perhaps um, uh, the other panelists can um, maybe comment on iRobot. And with that, uh, maybe um, I. Uh, uh, Mike, why don't we start with you if you would like to have any comments on? Sure. Um... The, this this set of uh, this set of movies um, um, is in a fine tradition, uh, starting with Frankenstein, and then the uh, short story called Rossum's Universal Robots, where we get the word robot from, and then all of Asimov's uh, work. One of the things about Asimov is that um, with his three laws of uh, robotics. Um, his robots tended to be a little more benign than um, what we see in 2001, where Hal is simply acting uh, logically um, with his primary goal uh, being um, the mission. And um, in Ex Machina, where Ava is acting towards um, her self-interest, uh, self-preservation. Um, and, you know, um, I would also include in this list um, the Westworld um, TV series, if uh, if I may, because again there is uh, self-preservation. So without some um, constraints on AI behavior, um, in fiction it seems like a lot of the time the um, AIs um, uh, do what we fear and treat us like uh, we treat each other. would add I don't see how one can have anything approximating intelligence without so self-realization and if you have self-realization then you have it seems to me by necessity a sense of uh, survival whatever it takes and that's where you can have a lot of danger. Um, there seems to be a lot of anxiety in uh, Silicon Valley about the the threat of artificial intelligence. Um, uh, I'm not sure I fully grasp uh, what uh, what they're afraid of. Um, do any of you guys have any insights about that? From what I've uh, from what I've heard, I mean, I, I listen to certain programs on the radio, like Crooks and Quarks on CBC Radio, and uh, they they have experts talking about uh, AI and, and its possible dangers. The thing about AI is that uh, it's it's like a computer program. If you don't do your pr computer program correctly, you can end up making silly mistakes, uh, printouts, but uh, part of a manufacturing process, and you slip your decimal point. You of something instead of one of something, or 10,000 instead of 100. 
Um, so you have to do your programming um, very carefully with AI. You don't make any mistakes. Like you want to make one scenario I heard is you want is a, a robot that's very good at making paper clips, and suddenly it goes out of control and turns everything, including human beings, dogs, rocks, trees, into paper clips. You have to be programming very carefully. Ah, uh, yes, that's the old no man conundrum. I have to destroy everything that is imperfect. But you yourself are imperfect, nomad. <laughs> Another comment. I, when you think of the complexity of the computer programming to create anything approximating artificial intelligence, it's an immense job to debug it. And fundamentally, anything created by human beings, well, especially having a focus, not being focused on other unintended or untoward consequences uh, will result rather, not, not so much in artificial intelligence, but in artificial stupidity at some point. There is a lot of criticism nowadays about the reliance on algorithms, so many um, online processes um, uh, are controlled by algorithms, job hiring, and um, uh, YouTube recommend recommendation lists, for example, have come under intense criticism for their reliance on algorithms, which turn out to be, um, you know, socially destructive. Um, and that is coming under a lot of scrutiny nowadays. So you were mentioning the matrix. We started this round of discussion with you talking about the matrix. So I'll, I'll tell you something. I'll, I'll give you a couple of my views on the matrix. One is it's, um, as I mentioned before, there are fantasies and there's science fiction. And the great thing about the matrix is you could actually roll those two together because within the person's mind, I mean, that's what's happening in the matrix. You're basically someone's mind is in some simulated scenario, like we are here almost now. Not as good as in the matrix, but you can have you can have fantasy within your science fiction. And do this, but I found that uh, particularly interesting. It all question the nature of reality. Are we all in the matrix? Um, <clears throat> right. Um, one of the issues I think the single biggest flaw in the matrix is the entire premise that humans are grown to provide energy for the machines. I think there's a there's a, a thermodynamics issue there where the energy it takes to grow the humans exceeds the energy that they produce. <laughs> yes, that's that's very insightful because I, I was going to mention that as a matter of fact. The, the whole energy scheme that they've come up with doesn't, doesn't really make sense. You don't need to create human beings. Human beings are extremely complex organisms and what you can do is you can use something similar like a lead acid battery and you get plenty of energy that without producing a human being. For a human being you have to create food which means you have to grow crops or you have to create at least some synthetically. Um, where do you, how do you cre create the energy? Where do you get the energy from for the food? Because the skies were scorched as they said so there's no sunlight for, for energy. So they did have a, a thermal fusion source so that would help, but then why do you need the humans on top of that? It's, it was a little bit contrived. Right, uh, but um, but if you gloss over that, it does create an extremely interesting uh, premise to kind of explore, you know, not just whether humans are, whether the human reality is quote unquote real, but um, I actually also, as I mentioned earlier, I really sort of liked the, the issue uh, of purpose, sort of what um, uh, what sort of values does the machine intelligence have? In the matrix, one of the key values of the machine intelligence is purpose, that every program has a purpose, kind of like a paperclip bending robot, purpose. Um, yes. And I, I thought that was a, an insightful um, value to give the machines. Yeah, that, that's... That's that's true, but I was also thinking that, as I said, the the, the whole energy scheme is contrived, as, as you mentioned, but another thing that's contrived is that if somehow they're killed in the matrix, their bodies are killed, uh, that that doesn't make sense. I mean, you can have the matrix designed that way so that there's some circuit that kills you when you're killed in the matrix. You could have it designed that way, but it would seem to me that 
these people who are no longer in the in in the plant as they call it that are separate in this in submarine in this hovercraft you can have them who are accessing the matrix from outside the plant you could have the you could have that circuit deactivated so that no one's in danger i mean that seems like an obvious thing to do and, and they keep that in there because it's more dramatic it's one of those premises that allows them um, uh, fictional liberty. Now, one other point I wanted to add quickly uh, for the copper tops as an energy source, 25% uh, of human metabolism is spent in cerebral activity. So if these um, uh, individuals were very, very inactive, uh, I don't know, that might help with figuring the energetics, but it was uh, not something you would want to try to sell as an engineering project. Yes, that's that's true. I was also thinking about iRobot. There were some comments about iRobot, the, the movie with Will Smith, um, saying it wasn't really true to Isaac Asimov's um, stories, and I, I'm afraid I have to disagree there. Um, let's start with the three laws of, of robotics. I, I, does everyone know the three laws of robotics? I'll, I'll just go ahead and summarize them for the for the students. Sure. I mean, it's the the first law is that no rob, robot may harm or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. The second law is that a robot must obey the orders given it by a human being unless it conflicts with the first law. And the third law is a robot must protect its own existence unless it conflicts with the first laws. Based on those, uh, the movie iRobot would seem a little bit far-fetched, but the, uh, Isaac Asimov actually, I mean, this was actually a, a combination of his different stories. And in his later stories on, on robots, he does point out that there is a problem with the first three laws, that it can lead to sort of a revolution in, in the sense that we saw in the movie. Because um, he was saying there could be a zeroth law, which is that, uh, robots must protect humanity um, and they must protect humanity uh, and not through an action allow humanity to come to harm so then if you consider that then suddenly the first law is not strictly adhered to because now you can kill a human being if it's better for all of humanity and that was what was happening uh, essentially in the movie fascinating yeah. hmm. that presents that robots with the same sort of moral dilemmas that humans face, you know, if you're, you know, if you're on the train track and it, there's a the split and there's one person on one branch and a crowd of people on the other, you know, which path do you take? And now, you know, intelligent robots have to fame that face that same moral dilemma that humans do. Yes, exactly. Uh, since um, I might as well leap into the leap into the hole here. Um, yeah, I mean, th th there's a there's a theme in let's see, I robot and also in, in extinction. Uh, in extinction. I don't want to be a. I, I, the problem with describing these movies is it's, it's, it's a spoiler for those who may want to watch the movies. Um, so I won't go into too much detail on extinction. It's on Netflix, and, I, and what I really liked about it was well, you'll have to watch it to see it, but it's about the um, about a, a, a very large population of synthetic people, as they were called, androids or, or robots. It ra raises the question of uh, they were treated by the humans extremely poorly. So it, it raises a, a very important question because in the future, I mean, already in Japan, you have very human looking robots or androids. Uh, how do we treat them? Do we give them rights as other human beings? Do we treat them like dirt because they're merely possessions? And to me, it seems to feed into this question about how we treat people from other ethnic groups. I mean, racism, bigotry, it seems to me that it, it's like an extension of, of that. You can argue that, you know, these things aren't even human, so we shouldn't, whoever, we don't even have to treat them like. I agree with that because the way you treat someone or something will affect you, not just the thing you're, you're affecting. So. It's, it's yeah. an interesting question that's raised by this movie. Um, yes, and you know it's reminiscent of the uh, uh, Next Generation uh, episode where Picard has to prove that Data 
is a sentient being, uh, kind of establishes principle artificial in of an artificial life form rights. Um, so we're almost out of time, and I hate this. I knew uh, we would run out of time before we were finished talking. I'm going to exercise my uh, prerogative as the moderator to also give a plug for surrogates, because I think many people may not have seen that. But just very briefly, the reason I love it is because in the premise of surrogates is that um, completely um, lifelike um, androids can be driven by people sitting in a gaming chair in their house. And the advantages of moving through the world with a completely realistic android avatar in the real world, it's basically an extension of Second Life migrated into the real world where avatars are now androids. But the benefits of this become so obvious that in fact, it's made a law that everyone has to have an, a, a, a surrogate, an, avatar, uh, an android that they move through. And everyone is sitting at home in these really complex gaming chairs, moving through the world in their robots. And um, so that I think is just a fascinating premise and it really pulls it off well because it toggles back and forth between the real life uh, lives of the characters when they sort of get out of their chairs and have to get up and eat and go to the bathroom and things like that. Um, and then uh, and then switches back to their uh, surrogate life. And um, also very interesting because there's a real, there's a fun mystery to it. Bruce Willis plays a detective and uh, a technology has been invented in which if you destroy someone's surrogate, it kills them in real life back in their gaming chair at home. And this threatens the entire social order that has been constructed around the um, the surrogates. And so he's trying to track down the technology. Yes, a little bit like the Matrix. So, um, so I really like the mystery part of it. So I think um, anyone who enjoys Second Life, I think will really get a kick out of surrogates and especially it's what it would be like if we were moving through the world um, in target and may I may I make a final point? Yes, please. Of uh, the four movies I had wanted to talk about um, some, I would like to just say uh, about two of them. Uh, 1951, the day the earth stood still, it was the first of that um, movie. It was redone with um, uh, Keanu Reeves, I guess. And it and the invasion of the body snatchers in 1978 uh, were uh, good examples of science fiction as responses of humankind to technological changes or new challenges as civilization progresses or uh, makes new uh, confrontational uh, challenges for themselves with uh, discoveries. Uh, the, the day the earth stood still was a huge political statement about the fact that humankind had become weaponized to the point that we could destroy entire cities or our entire civilization um, with atomic weapons, nuclear weapons. And uh, aliens who, they weren't benign and they weren't malicious, they were just, it was just business. Uh, Klaatu shows up with uh, his uh, killer, police robot Gort, and um, he gets shot promptly by the authorities in Washington because he holds up a gift for the president. And uh, at any rate, he's here to warn humankind that if they don't um, 
live peacefully, their planet would be destroyed. And he had to figure out a way to get them to listen. It uh, was a wonderful uh, movie. It's quite dated in its style, but Michael Rennie was the British actor who played uh, Kwatu, and he uh, was an extraordinary actor, in my opinion. Uh, the Invasion of the Body Snatchers also was a social statement uh, and political s statement. The, this exotic, beautiful flower shows up on the ground. It's part of a systematic um, reign of aliens in the forms of flowers that are, seem attractive. The people will take them home and plant them. And then um, when they sleep, tendrils come out of the flower and start to envelop the person and they are replaced. And you think of the Charlottesville marchers yelling, Jews will not replace us and um, that sort of thing. The invasion of the body snatchers, uh, the, the 1978 version was a remake of a 1953 version. Both of them really reflect xenophobia and fear of aliens coming in and making us uh, disappear, or become irrelevant, and uh, uh, it's the same stuff we're dealing with now toward people that are different, quote, tribes, unquote. So, yes, it, it absolutely. Originally, uh, the original one was about McCarthyism, but the idea of um, fear of other tribes or tribal thinking in humans is, is um, pretty much still with us. And that, I made a mis mistake uh, in a sense. I uh, showed that to my daughter when she was eight. <laughs> and my two other children were out. So we sat and watched Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And she would never sleep in a room with a flower in it again. <laughs> uh, so my bad. Yeah, but at I'd any like rate, to... I I really encourage those two films, and I'm I'm finished. Thank you. Okay, I just wanted to make a, a request to the group to uh, suggestions to the group that might consider Baragon and, and Chantal. That this seems to be a very rich topic, um, science fiction in general. Um, there, uh, one one of the topics that we call was science fiction books and so on. We might have another session on, on science fiction movies again someday. I think most people would like them. And Absolutely. I, 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 I was thinking you read my mind. We should have a part two. Yeah, maybe, yeah, sometime. It doesn't have to be next next time, but we, we, we could try that. Another suggestion is, uh, as I said before, I think the difference between science fiction and fantasy is really important, and I think what we should do is have a session where we, we talk about that. Why, why, why the difference is important, and give examples of things on each side, and why we think that something is science fiction and fantasy. Oh. And so on. Yes, I slides, love that idea. I was going to show. I had a definition of fantasy uh, to contrast it with uh, uh, the definition of science fiction, and uh, the fantasy uh, definition I was going to use was that it's a form of literary genre in which a plot cannot occur in the real world, which usually involves witchcraft, magic, um, taking place in an undis on an undiscovered planet or in an unknown world. And the theme and setting have combinations of technology and architecture and language, often set in European medieval age type arrangements. But, uh, these are the sorts of movies with the talking animals. Yeah, I, I, that's a, yeah. A, it's a good point about fantasies being about magic. But the thing is, you have to define magic. How does that differ from science? And I sort of have a definition for that. But I, well, I, we don't want to talk about that now. Maybe we want to talk about that during the panel session of that someday. Good point. Yes, thank you all. This uh, was just super enjoyable. I, I'm. Uh, a little concerned. I think we've really gone over our time, though. Um, uh, I did want to um, maybe uh, 
uh, give Chantal a chance to promote uh, the next uh, panel discussion, uh, which will be happen in November. The topic is um, going to be the Cambrian explosion and the history of life, um, which I think will be a, a rich topic for discussion. And Students will enjoy um, if uh, uh, want to out a call for uh, anyone who would be panel to discuss the Cambrian explosion and the history of life to contact me or um, and then also give Chantal an opportunity to take care of any uh, group business that. Uh, be Thank you, Baragon. Thanks to Chantal and Jess. And I appreciate the uh, chance to be on the panel. Yes, thanks again, Baragon. Thanks to the panel members, Mike and Tagline. I appreciate your presence here. And thanks to, to everyone else. Yes, definitely. Thanks, everyone. And thanks to the audience who took uh, part of their Saturday to uh, join us. Yes, I agree. I, I really enjoyed the uh, 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 audience participation in the nearby chat. That was uh, uh, really added a lot to our discussion, I think. So, uh, all right, I guess with that, I will adjourn uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, edition of our Science Circle panel discussions and uh, look forward to seeing you all next time.